found a. I found it. Okay, thank you. Never mind. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to uh, in announce to you that our final speaker of the conference will lay the foundation for how we take action together to achieve a fair and just Alberta. The very reverend Dr. Phil, Bill Phipps is an outspoken activist in Calgary and throughout Canada. Bill is the co-founder of Faith and the Common Good, a national interfaith network of people taking action on climate change. Oh, we start? Is that true? They give me the wrong bio? Well, that's right. Yeah, okay. What, you don't believe it? <laughs> she doesn't believe I could Well, you looked surprised when I said that. <laughs> Just saying it's good. We start with, you know, sort of the whole motion around climate, this, this. And here we have you. Yeah. <laughs> so praying for change, praying for change, and climate uh, correction doesn't isn't enough. Should I introduce you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bill has worked as a poverty lawyer, adult educator, and minister at United Churches in Calgary and Toronto. From 1997 to 2000, he was the moderator of the United Church of Canada. Bill once delivered a sermon titled, The Joy, Joy of Paying Taxes. So it, is not, <laughs> so it may not be surprised to you that in 2002 he challenged then Canadian Alliance leader Stephen Harper in the Calgary Southwest by-election. I didn't win. <laughs> Imagine the world we'd have if you had. <laughs> During his by-election campaign against Harper, Bill declared, when I pay my taxes, I do so joyfully because they help pay for the common good. Unfortunately, as you just heard, Bill was not successful, as we all know. Unfortunately, Bill was not successful, but he did play second in a very conservative riding. So, yes. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you, give him the podium now, Mr. Bill Phipps, Reverend Bill Phipps. Well, it's been a wonderful conference, and it's uh, great to be in Edmonton and see a lot of old friends, old being the operative word. Uh, if you look around, a lot of the white hairs in this room, many of them are people that uh, I worked with when I lived in, uh, in Edmonton. And to see a lot, of, a lot of other people that we've had common cause with over the years. And uh, so it's great to be here, and this was a wonderful event. I'm going to start off with a, 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 a quotation that I, I use a lot, and I got it in a magazine called Resurgence Magazine. It comes out of uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, it's really quite a marvelous uh, magazine. And here's, here's a, a page that was in it. This crisis is bringing us an opportunity to experience what few generations in history ever have the privilege of knowing a generational mission. The acceleration of a compelling moral purpose, a shared and unifying cause. The thrill of being forced by circumstance to put aside the pettiness and conflict that so often stifle the restless human need for transcendence. I think that's a great line. The thrill of being forced by circumstances. Most of us don't like that. But the thrill of it to put aside the pettiness and conflict that so often stifle the restlessness of the human need for transcendence. The opportunity to rise. And when we do rise, it will fill our spirits and bind us together. Those who are now suffocating in cynicism and despair will be able to breathe freely. Those who are now suffering from a loss of meaning in their lives will find hope. When we rise, we will experience an epiphany as we discover that this crisis is not only about politics and economics, it is a moral and spiritual challenge. I believe that firmly, and as a, as a religious leader and person who works with many faith traditions around the world, uh, the, the whole idea of a moral and spiritual uh, component to what we're talking about is very dear to my heart and I think something essential to know. The person who said this, this quote is from Al Gore, 
as he was uh, getting engaged in launching the inconvenient truth. I believe that this is a great time to be alive, like uh, this core statement says. Humankind faces unprecedented challenges in our relationships with Mother Earth and our relationships with each other. All, everybody here knows the story of climate change and poisoning and digging up the earth, huge wealth alongside heartbreaking poverty, human butchering, corporate rule, and deliberate destruction of democracy. It is all related, all these things are related in part of a holistic understanding of, of life. This is also a moment of grace and opportunity. That's Thomas Berry's phrase. It's a moment of grace and opportunity. There are unprecedented global uh, initiations in every part of the world, whether there are groups of five or six trying to save their river or whether there are huge organizations that reach around the world, organizations that are represented in this room. Here in Alberta, this is another thing I picked up a little bit from, from Avi, but I was going to say this anyway. Here in Alberta, I believe we've got all the ingredients for making the changes the people yearn for in their hearts, even if they don't quite realize what those changes are. We've got everything here. We've got the brains, we've got the people, we've got the resources, we've got the sun, we've got the wind. We've got everything it takes to make the transition into a sustainable world. We need the will, and we need the leadership, and we need the sense of hope, and all those things to create a society here, actually in Alberta, of justice, hope, and beauty. Now writing and living this new story requires all of us. Not just some people and not just some groups of people, requires all of us throughout our society as the issues we face touch all aspects of life. It's the whole thing. Politics, economics, social, ecological, cultural, scientific, health, education, all of human experience and life, in fact, of all the life of Mother Earth is included in our challenge that we have before us. And this weekend, at least I, and I think as I've talked to people, have been inspired by challenging and articulate presenters and people committed to building a fair and just society. So my comments are going to reflect <coughs> and, and dovetail, I think, pretty well. Uh, first of all, with Avi Lewis's opening, opening talk, I heard him give the talk in, in Calgary on Wednesday night. It's the same one that he gave here. Uh, it's actually, when I heard him and I went up to him and talked to him afterwards, I said, you know, Avi, we are good bookends to this conference because what we say, uh, what, what we're talking about, really dovetails, I think, quite well. We are not alone. Sometimes those of us engaged in struggles and, and trying to make changes, we, we, we can get uh, feeling as though we're sort of by ourselves or our little group, you know, and, and we get nervous and we get depressed sometimes and, and we wonder, we are not alone. We are part of a great band of citizens worldwide who are seeking a different, a different, better world. And they are at our sides in solidarity and encouragement. Naomi Klein in, in her book, and then obviously with the film about it, This Changes Everything, recognizes, and this is kind of cool, you know, to recognize uh, the intimate connection of economics and the, all the issues of, of the economy and ecology. Our economic system, she says, is at war with Mother Earth. She also recognizes, and this also did my heart good, uh, she recognizes the very special place of indigenous peoples in the calling to turn it all around. Not just sort of as an add-on or, oh yeah, we've got to involve indigenous people, but at the heart of the changes we need are the culture and the spirituality of First Nations of this land. That's part of the grace of this land. And David Corton, some of you know, in his latest book called Change the Story, Change the Future, 
also recognizes how everything is connected. David's recognized this for some time, and you can see it as his writing has progressed, but he needs, we, he says, again, we need a new story to move us into the changes we need. He calls the old story the, the sacred money, sacred market story, and he says it's based on bad ethics, bad science, and bad economics. That's not a great recommendation for the old story, is it? We need a new story that Corton calls sacred life, living earth narrative. The old story we are leading, as we've heard from a whole range of people here, is literally killing Mother Earth and creates extreme poverty alongside extreme wealth. Attacks on education and on public health and on all kinds of, of realities and institutions that we've built up over the decades and as we, as we heard in the last 30 years have been chipped away and chipped away and chipped away by corporate power and the corporate agenda. The old story, I think, allows for no sacred place. No sacred place. It just drives me nuts that as global warming is heating up the Arctic and the ice is melting, everybody's lining up to dig the crap out of there. That's immoral. It's wrong. But that's what they're doing. No place is sacred. Even national parks can have licenses to get a little bit of oil out of there, you know. The old story has no sacred place. The whole earth is open to extraction, exploitation, destruction to feed our hyperconsumption. Now the conference, uh, beginning with Avi, reminded us that everything is connected. We can no longer support silo thinking. And uh, I've grown up in a world of silo thinking. I work sometimes with universities, which is kind of an interesting thing. But this department doesn't talk to this department, doesn't talk to this department. You think, geez, you know, they should talk to each other because they've got some stuff in common. Oh, no, there's jealousies and there's turf and there's all these things, personalities. And we live in silos. Like we can no longer do that. It's outmoded thinking, it's dangerous thinking, it doesn't work, actually, if we want to change the world. In fact, the wor words economy and ecology, many of you know, come from the same root word, meaning household. <laughs> so, the way we treat Mother Earth and the way we live out our economics are intimately related. They come from the same word. It's like, how do we manage our household in a way that is fair, just, and sustainable. A healthy earth breeds a healthy economy and a healthy society. And the economy and the environment are not alternatives as a certain, certain leaders continue to tell us. We gotta save the economy and then we'll worry about the earth. That's the leader of our country talks like that. It's nonsense. Leaders of other parties in other parts of Canada, including Alberta, some of them talk like that. It's nonsense. They are not alternatives. And so, as we found out in this conference, with event after event and speaker after speaker and in the, in the workshops, we need holistic thinking and the framing of our actions, the framing of our story, connecting the dots, as I think three different speakers talked about connecting the dots, where we see climate change, social justice, and economic justice as a whole. You can't have one without the others. They're deeply connected. And in our new story, Holistic Fabric, and I was very delighted actually that many recognized the essential role of First Nations in Canada and Indigenous people around the world as the soul and heart of what we have to do if we are to make the transitions and the radical changes we need. For me, actually, a, a good follow-up to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which, as you know, is issuing its, its report in another couple of months, a great follow-up would say is, you know, <laughs> here is our opportunity for true, honest 
meaningful reconciliation, working together for the common good, for the common health of, the, of Mother Earth, which sustains us and supports life. Like, what an opportunity. It's a, it's a gift. We've had some truth-telling, and now we've got opportunities of reconciliation of bringing the First Nations of this land and non-Native people, the settlers to this land, together in common cause for a different kind of future that all of us yearn for. And I, I think it's, it's, it's just a, a wonderful opportunity uh, for all of us. Now, we've heard, I'm going to just sort of re recall some of the things that we've heard because they, they relate to each other. We've heard that Albertans have high hopes and low expectations. I think that's a great phrase. <laughs> and it's true, actually. <laughs> what we need, obviously, now, and what we're challenged to need and called to remedy is to transform all that into high hopes and high expectations. High expectations of all of us to create the kind of world we want. Or as Maria Dunn's words last night in, in one of her songs that is about a better way, we can write a better story. She talks about a better story. We know, we actually do know a better way. And we know a better Alberta can be built by this holistic understanding. Now to do so, to build this, better way to write and live this new story, we need huge mobilization and a lot of people talked about that. They talked about we need that, a, a larger mobilization of people uh, from all walks of life in all kinds of organizations. Sometimes there are organizations that have disparate goals in their own thing but we have common ground for the common good and we need to connect the dots of our passionate causes we have to unite our struggles for all people and not just allow the corporate interests to have sway and watch, you know, while the social movements just do their little things on their own. People just sit there in their corporate towers in Calgary and say, well, that's good. Turning out just like we wanted. Everybody's got their own little agenda. We have to find ways to not forget the agendas of our organizations. I mean, I, I'm a member of a church. I've got, you know, our church has agendas, right? But that's nice. We can go off and do that, but we need to join with everybody else to build a better world. Everybody who's in an organization in this room are parts of organizations that have a mandate from your membership, you know, an agenda that you establish at your annual meetings and all that stuff. I know all about that. But, you know, now is the time when we have to come together and sometimes overcome conflicts we may have had with other organizations or the way they do their work and all the rest of it. Now is the moment that we have to come together, both with our own mandates as well as the much larger mandate of creating a new story. And I heard this again and again, not only in the plenary but in the workshops as well. The struggles, you know, of teachers, students, nurses, patients, children, daycare workers, seniors, care workers, First Nations, small businesses, and Mother Earth are all part of a common fabric. They're part of a common, wonderful, beautiful Earth in which we live, and they're part of a new and a better story. People from Beaver Lake Cree to nursing homes to overcrowded classrooms to drop-in centers to chronic care centers and patients to every sector seek to live sustainably. That's what we have to be about together and find ways to do it together to create, uh, as Jacqueline said in, in a wonderful phrase, to live justly, peacefully, and sustainably. That's what we're about. Overwhelmingly, uh, we called for, in our, in our groups as well as in the plenary, we called for collective mobilization, breaking out of our silos, writing a new, positive, bold story with humankind living within the laws of Mother Earth. Now, in addition to all of this, many recognize privatization for what it is, a corporate power play to 
you know, put as many things under the control of corporate power as possible. <clears throat> I want you to know, well, you know, I'm, I'm from Calgary, uh, that place of revolution. <laughs> right? What? Isn't it? Well, anyway, uh, that place, Calgary. But I want you to know that one of the phrases that our, our mayor uses all the time in his, when he, when he does his stump speeches, he will usually say, you know what? Uh, and he came from a, a, a lower income uh, f immigrant family. And he said, you know what? I am who I am because of public institutions. And he'll stand there at the Chamber of Commerce in, uh, in, in Calgary or whoever has to listen to the mayor and he'll say, I went to a great public school. I got educated in a good public school system. I learned how to swim in a public swimming pool. I always took public transit. I, always, I spent Saturdays in the public library. And he would go down the list of the public institutions that give us all life and that we all depend on. And he does it again and again and again to, to remind people of the, of the importance of public institutions. Um, so I, I challenge, uh, one of the things I, I want to do is to challenge Public Interest Alberta or whoever else has the, 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 the vision and the capacity to do this after the election in another month to bring the groups here represented and, and others together to begin to actually map out strategically, step by step, the specific action plans. Some of them are up there, and some of them you're going to get back feedback from the sheets that have been filled out. But to take that stuff and say and make a commitment to bringing folks together with, an, with the agenda to map out the strategy about how the mobilization is actually going to happen. Because I know what usually happens, people will go away, and I know people are going to talk in, the, in your own organizations and all that stuff, and periodically we'll gather like this and hear what's going on and so on. One of my challenges is that Public Interest Alberta or somebody bring people together and to try to break down whatever silos there are, for this mass mobilization that everybody in this room says we need. Now, I know that's a tough job, and, and I know that everybody's busy, especially with the, in your own organizations. I can say that myself in the organizations that I'm part of, but it's absolutely essential if we're serious about all the stuff that we've talked about, about a just and fair Alberta and how to get there. And I, I guess that what the challenge is, is can we pull people together and say, okay, we are going to meet whatever time, whatever it is once a month for three years to map out a particular action plan, and we're going to hold ourselves to it. I share uh, Ricardo's uh, comments about Thomas King and his appreciation of Thomas King and the importance of story. In my book, which is called Cause for Hope, I talk about a new story having been written. That's what David Corton is talking about and, and so on. We need to mobilize together to write and to live out that new story. Other things that were talked about were taxes, and I'm glad Heather mentioned that sermon. That's, I preached that sermon in Edmonton close to 30 years ago, and when I preached that sermon, four suits walked out of the congregation right in the <laughs> middle of the sermon. Oh, that was, that was a badge of honor, I thought. They were pissed off enough that they left. And they walked out. But you know what happened with that? Is that the minister was all upset. I was guest preaching. And when you're guest preaching, you go in there and raise hell and leave. <laughs> they have to pick up the pieces. But you know, he came to me afterwards. He says, well, what are we going to do about that? Four suits walked out. I don't know how much money that meant in terms of the collection plate. But... What we organized were four evenings, four Tuesday evenings in a row, to talk about faith in the economy. And we had debates. Preston Manning was involved. He was debating a left-wing economist from the University of Alberta. We had four evenings, and over 200 people came each time, because they thought, well, what is this? What does faith have to do with the economy? Well, we explored that. So that was a great sermon, and people still remember it because it touches a nerve. 
gives us an opportunity to talk about the common good. And about what taxes are for, and I'm glad we had that a little bit of that conversation here. I heard in one of the one of the workshops that um, one of the difficulties in in coming together is that all of our organizations, and th this isn't me, this is someone uh, uh, in a major union or organi union organization saying, we all have our rules and we all have our procedures and they have to be followed and you can't do this without that. I know I'm in the church, okay, so I can say this quite honestly because we have our rules and all that stuff. And in the United Church, we pride ourselves on being open, right? And we are, I think. To ourselves, we are. <laughs> a lot of people, all those rules and procedures we've got that we think help our organization to function, to other people, they're barriers. You know? So this person was saying, you know, maybe for this really to happen, we got to loosen up in terms of our rules and procedures and how we present ourselves and all the rest of it. I thought that was a great confession as well as uh, an, an insight as to what one of the things it might take for that mobilization of all of us to actually actually happen. Somebody else in, in another, I think it was another one of the workshops, talked about anti-oppression training. I'd never heard that phrase before. It's a great phrase. I mean, we talk about nonviolent training for social action and all that stuff, but anti-oppression training, because a lot of people don't realize they're oppressed. They might be depressed, but they don't realize <laughs> that their depression comes because they are oppressed by a system that is crushing <coughs> the human spirit, crushing their heart and their ambitions and their dreams and their hopes for themselves. And their, and their loved ones. Some of the things up there that people wrote about, one person's going to run for public office now. Well, she didn't put down the party she's going to run for. It's probably a good thing, I don't know. But anyway, run for public office. Someone else is going to put on solar panels on their, on their house. A lot of people said they're going to actually make a point of visiting their MLA both before and after the election. Uh, some other people talked about their givings are going to change, like the, how, they, how they give and where they give and how much they give various organizations, some very good stuff. Now, I'm almost finished, uh, Bill. I know you're, you're worried, but <clears throat> I'm not worried because I got the mic. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's some of the feedback and some of the stuff that went on, but I want to add another layer uh, before we leave here. Uh, the things that I think are really important in our engagement at this momentous time, what Thomas Berry calls the great work, and I've got a hat that says, the great work begins. This is a play in New York, it had nothing to do with Thomas Berry's book, The Great Work, but I think it's great anyway. Great work begins. I think there's some special qualities, if you will, human qualities that we need that some of us uh, forget about. I, and I, when I say some of us, I mean me <laughs> uh, a lot of the time. Uh, forget about. And the first one, uh, we talk about a positive story, a positive news story, a positive vision. We can't just be trashing everything that's going on. We need to put a vision out there that people say, holy oh, geez, yeah, that's right. That's what my heart wants. <laughs> you know? One of the things is gratitude. We live in a beautiful world. Our earthly home is amazingly fragile, complex, resilient, stunning. And so regardless of how outraged, and we should be, how depressed or anxious we feel about the state of the world or the state of our community or the state of our city or whatever, or corporate power, greed, climate change, the destruction of democracy in this country, poverty, and those things that really play on our minds all the time. Regardless of, of how we feel about those things and where our spirits are, I think we have to begin every day of our work with a sense of what we're grateful for, with that positive place in our soul, you know? Gratitude for the gift of life, for, for beauty that is around us. One of the things that does my heart good, that I need to do, is just go for a 
half hour walk along the Bow River periodically and just be amazed at this beautiful river running through the heart of my city. It's simple, it's not a great big thing. Or watch the rabbits or the squirrels outside the door and see them rustling around. We live in a beautiful world, so be grati gratitude for beauty, for complexity, for simplicity. Gratitude that, yeah, we still have some water we can drink or air we can breathe. Gratitude for the prairies, for the mountains, for the rivers, for the forests, for the butterflies, for the cougars, for art and music and liveliness and literature and film, for imagination, for eco-justice, for human justice, for relationships. Gratitude for the love that we share with people and other creatures and for the earth herself. Abraham Heschel once said, our goal should be to live in radical amazement. <laughs> Isn't that great? Radical amazement. We live in an amazing world at an amazing time in human history. Uh, one little story. Uh, she's older now, but when my granddaughter Kate was three years old, we were camping on Manitoulin Island on Lake Huron. And it was a beautiful morning, and I, I got, she's three, okay? So I get up with my coffee, and I walk out onto the rocks, uh, from the campsite onto the rocks, and I'm, I'm just looking at this beautiful, calm lake, and the, the sun is up, and it's a gorgeous, perfect uh, day in the Great Lakes. And, uh, and I hear this little voice, Grandpa, and this beautiful little three-year-old is staggering across the rocks, coming out from the campsite, it's going like this, you know? And I turn around, and I look at her, and... This is, without a word of a lie, this is what she did. She stood on those rocks and this little three-year-old threw open her arms and she said, what a beautiful world! <laughs> what a beautiful world. So we should be able to come together <laughs> to live in it with appreciation and with love and with, and with respect. And so wonder, amazement, beauty are essential to keeping our sanity, I think. And they're essential if we are to put forward a positive vision for the world we want to help create. Another thing we need is imagination. Many of us here, and again I speak for myself uh, particularly, live in our heads. I love living in my, in my little old head even if it's shaved off. <clears throat> but we also need to live from our hearts. And many times begin the task that we're undertaking from this day forward with our hearts engaged. Live with imagination. Live with the artist and the theater that is within each one of us. We are kin, you know, to all of life. That tree, that robin, that salmon, that butterfly, that other person, whoever she is, and so on. Artists are also part of this. We need to bring the artistic expression into our work. They are essential. In fact, I think the prophets, the, the artist is the true prophet of our time because they reflect the world to us, but they also point to other worlds that are possible. And by artists, of course, I mean novelists and poets and singers and painters, filmmakers, writers, all of the people who exercise their imagination and their artistic expression to inspire and motivate us and give us another lens, another angle to look at, at life and the world. The artist is essential for social movements. That's one of the reasons I was so delighted to be here last night was music and those things are essential to the movement. You can't have a movement unless you're moving. And you can't move unless you've got some music in your heart, right? So you see, I think a sense of wonder and imagination and hope is a hallmark of the human spirit. And these qualities are at the heart of our collective actions. And the last one I'll, I'll, I'll mention and then I'll wrap up. And that is humility. Uh, <clears throat> when I was launching my book called Cause for Hope, I had a whole chapter on humility. And David Corden invited me to come to Seattle and, and, and talk about it. And I, I talked about humility, and at the end of it, David said, you know, I don't know whether, he wasn't sure whether I should have sort of been that vulnerable to talk about humility. And I said, David, you're wrong. 
Uh, and I like David Clark. I, I think he's a great analyst of what's going on in the world. Anyway, uh, his latest book talks about humility a little bit. Uh, it's very important. Human beings, you see, are not the pinnacle of creation. We think we are. We think we're sort of the end product. We're not. In fact, we're pretty recent on the scene of this beautiful Mother Earth. And we are embedded in the earth. We come from the earth. That's what we go back to. We're not all that special. We're, we're pretty good. I mean, there's great, there's great aspects of the human personality and human spirit. But we're not the be-all and the end-all at all. And we need to figure that out because we live in a very arrogant world of, of human entitlement, of, of humanity at the center of every goddamn thing. We're not. We need to develop a sense of humility. And you know what? When we do that, our actions will be that much more authentic and real and create the possibility for real change. One of my own personal lessons on that was uh, when I moved to Alberta, one of the first things I did was go up, you know, the Northwest Territories. And Father René Fumelo used to run a thing called the Dene, Dene Day Seminar. And it was uh, being with the uh, Dene Nation and, and people in the... In near uh, off Great Bear Lake, and one of the exercises was that they take you out and they drop you on the land uh, around Great Bear Lake and leave you there for 24 hours without any, any food or water or anything. And you were just to experience being on the land by yourself in this vast, vast, vast place. And I remember very clearly, so almost 30 years ago, I did this. Uh, it's like it was yesterday, looking out. So I'm all by myself on the, uh, by, on the land, and I'm looking out, and it's very gray and brownish and, and so on. It doesn't look very interesting. It looks kind of drab. Just endless horizon and space, right? And, I, and I'm looking out, it's all this sort of uninteresting. There's no mountains or trees or anything like that. It's just gray. Until I got down on my knees and being a you know, being a religious person, you get down on your knees to pray, right? But it doesn't matter. Get down on my knees and looking at the beautiful little wildflowers and the mosses and the colors. I mean, all the colors of the rainbow were there, but you had to get down on your knees to really look and appreciate the beauty and the delicacy and all of that stuff. And I thought, well, holy work, you know. This is a good thing for human beings to do is to get down on our knees with some humility and just recognize the beautiful place in which we have been born and where we are called to live. Arrogance has no place in the movement for social justice and economic justice and climate justice. So a positive vision based on, based on huge gratitude for being alive today and part of this great work that we are called to be part of. I'm going to close with a, with a um, sort of the introduction to David Corden's book called The Great Turning. And he takes that from Joanna Macy, who is just one of these, I don't know, Joanna's probably about 85 years old, still dancing. She's a, a, a Buddhist, American Buddhist and has written a number of things on the new story and the new ways of being and all those kinds of things. If ever you get a chance to meet Joanna Macy, go see her. She's one of the great people. Anyway, uh, she, she writes about the great journey, and, and so does David Corton. And this is um, uh, at the beginning of his book called The Great Journey. And it's something for us to ponder as we leave this place with all of the wonderful uh, stimulation that we have been privileged to be part of it and to hear from wonderful people. Here's what David says, by what name will our children and our children's children call our time? Will they speak in anger and frustration of the time of the great unraveling when profligate consumerism led to an accelerating wave of collapsing environmental systems, violent competition for what remained of the Earth's resources, a dramatic dieback of the human population and a fragmentation of those who remained into warring fiefdoms ruled by ruthless local lords? 
or will they look back in joyful celebration on the noble time, the noble time of the great turning, when their forebears, that's us, turned crisis into opportunity, embraced the higher order potential of their human nature, learned to live in creative partnership with one another and the living earth, and brought forth a new era of human possibility. So the great turning, he says, is not a prophecy yet. It is a possibility. And the challenge for us as we leave this place is to embrace that possibility with all of our creative imagination, our gratitude for being alive at this moment, and finding ways to work together to create that irresistible movement that will bring into being the story that we really want to live. May it be so. Thank you. Wow, radical <laughs> amazement. Okay. Um, I love your words uh, when you said you can't have a movement unless you're moving. And uh, may you never stop moving, sir. <laughs> because we need you. And as a thank you for being here today, and in some ways a thank you for what you have done and continue to do, a little gift from public interest over.